Okay, so we're getting into lab six, histology, and we're going to break this chapter up into two parts. We're going to talk about epithelial tissue and nervous tissue first, and then get into connective and muscular. Okay, so what you need to know is uh, really what we're going to hit at over and over and over again in this class is structure, location, function, and the general relationship between those three things. So what is it, where is it, and what does it do? All right, and so we're going to start off with tissues, and just real generally, tissues are basically cells plus other stuff, proteins, uh, sugars, collagen, things like that, that have or serve a particular function. And when you throw two tissues together, you form an organ. And so you're kind of building up uh, to more complex and uh, more functionally interesting uh, materials. All right, and so there's four main tissue types, epithelial, nervous, connective, and muscular. And again, we're going to focus on epithelial and nervous in this first part. So you're going to see this slide pop up a whole bunch. And what it's detailing is really this relationship between structure, function, and location. Right? So how these three things feed together to kind of form a tissue or form anything, really. And so you can just real generally look at it. You say, okay, if it, it's a very simple structure, if it has one cell uh, length, it's probably not going to give you a lot of protection. There's not really dealing with sensation, per se. You're really looking at stuff like diffusion, right? So if it's one layer, stuff is going to diffuse very rapidly through it. And where do you want simple diffusion, or where do you want rapid diffusion? Uh, your lungs. Right? And so we're going to build on this stuff. And you should be able to use two of these things to figure out the third. And really, uh, it's kind of a higher level concept in the sense that you should be able to figure out uh, what tissues do or, you know, you want to better understand what tissues do. Really think about these relationships, what it's made up of, what that would be best, what best function that would serve, and then what's a really uh, logical location for it to be located. Okay, so as we get into epithelial tissues, you should know tables 6-1 and 6-2. And really what that's detailing is just basic shapes and organization of epithelial tissue. And so the way to think about it is that epithelial tissue is what we describe as being highly cellular uh, or having a high cell, uh, cell to matrix ratio. If you look at that picture in the corner, you think of the telephone booth itself as the matrix and the people as cells, and you can see that there's a little bit of matrix, but mostly it's just people or cells shoved in there. And that's really what epithelial tissue is. It often covers or lines most of the body, and it's really tightly packed in there. So it's relying on other system or other blood vessels to, through diffusion to, keep, uh, to get oxygen and blood to it. All right, so when you think of epithelial tissue, think of covering or lining parts of the body. And just some general terminology uh, before we really get into the specific types of epithelial tissue is that the cell is going to have what's called an apical surface and a basal surface. Apical means apex and or the top, and that's going to be the part that's facing uh, the external uh, environment or internal body cavities, it's facing away from the point of attachment, right? So that's going to be distal. So compare that to basal, which has the same root as basement, it's going to be the bottom. And the basal surface is a, the part that's attached to the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is basically collagen and proteins that are going to tie that to some of the underlying connective tissue. Uh, usually it's areolar tissue, and we'll get into that in the next part, but just know that the basal surface is the part that attaches to the basement membrane. Okay, so the way that epithelial tissues are defined are through either the shape or the number of layers. And the shapes can be squamous, cuboidal, or columnar. So squished down, cube-like, or column-like. And then the number of layers that are associated with it are either simple, which means one layer, stratified, which means more than one layer, and then pseudostratified, which means that it kind of looks like there's multiple layers, but all the layers are actually touching the basement membrane, which makes it simple, right? So if all the cells are touching the basement membrane, 
that's only one layer. It doesn't matter that it appears that there's two. If they're all touching, it's still one layer. Okay, and so the way that these things are defined are, are, are by the, typically by the, the shape of the cells, right? And so if you look at a simple epithelial right there, uh, it's going to, um, I would say that's simple columnar, right? Because it has a column-like shape. If you look at the next one, you're going to define that shape by the apical cell. So just like the apical part of the cell, the apical layer of cells is going to be the topmost or the outermost layer. Right? And so this case, it's going to be stratified cuboidal. right? Because if you look at that top layer, that apical layer, they're cube-like. All right, so here's some examples of what we're talking about of simple epithelium versus stratified epithelium. You know, really classic simple cuboidal. You're just going to see it in tube-like shapes. Uh, they're associated with tubules, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about why. But you know, get used to thinking about okay, I have a basic shape here. I have a basic number of layers. Let's go figure out how this is named. Okay, so simple squamous is going to be a single row of flat cells, and you're looking at both a transverse and a top-down view. All right, so the the side view is going to be they're going to look that classic squish. The top view is going to kind of look like pavement, or sometimes they look like sunny side up eggs. But just know that when you see these types of views, these are going to be simple squamous. All right, and so simple squamous what it allows for is really rapid diffusion and in particular, I associate it with oxygen, right? So O2 can pass through these things pretty readily. And you see them, you see this tissue in areas where you want rapid diffusion of oxygen, right? With the heart, the blood vessels, the lungs, in particular the alveoli, which are little structures within the lungs, uh, where the sites of oxygen uh, passage. All right, so again, the structures squish down, single row, you find them in your lungs, and it's going to allow rapid diffusion, particular oxygen. All right, so moving along, you have simple cuboidal. Simple cuboidal, again, a single row. It's going to be cube-like shapes. And these are really dealing, again, with absorption, secretion, or diffusion, uh, but not of oxygen. It's more of thicker substances. So uh, it's kind of uh, serious fluids or sweat and oil. So they have a thicker kind of consistency to them. And these really line tubules, right? So the really classic simple cuboidal is to see these guys in a bunch of different circles. And you see them in kidneys and glands and livers, things that are dealing with absorption and secretion. Uh, you know, and so it's really um, you know, allowing for uh, less kind of more resistance um, are more, yeah, more resistance for movement, okay? And so if you look at this image, imagine a straw that's been cut in half and you're looking at the side of the straw and that's what you're seeing, right? So you're seeing the two thin edges of the straw here. So this is a tubule that's, that's kind of cut uh, lengthwise and you get the idea that it's made up of simple cuboidal. Okay, simple columnar. Uh, again, it's going to be column-shaped. There's a couple key characteristics you need to pay attention to. All the nuclei, those purple blobs in the middle, are all in a row. And you have a couple of structures that are associated with it. Uh, the first one that pops out is the goblet cell. And a goblet cell is just like that thing in uh, Game of Thrones, right? So they all drink wine from a goblet. Right? So this is your own body's, your body's own little goblet. Instead of wine, it's filled with fluids such as mucus in this example. Uh, but so you have these mucus-filled goblets that are going to be able to secrete this mucus into the cavity. And then you have microvilli, right? And the function of microvilli is to increase the surface area, right? So if you look at them, they're kind of these little finger projections that stick out. And so basically what's happening is that you're getting more bang for your buck in that general area, right? So you... <sighs> You find these in your intestines, and as you're moving along, you're trying to digest this food the best that you can, but you get a limited amount of space to do it. So you want to really increase or make it make this process as efficient as possible, and microvilli uh, effectively allow that. 
So again, really classic, simple columnar is going to have these column shapes, all the nuclei in a row, and then other these associated structures like goblet cells and microvilli. All right, here's an example uh, of an of a actual slide, probably around 400x magnification. And if you look at it, that blue line right there is showing you or really emphasizing that the nuclei, uh, though there's some variation, they're really set up in a row, right? They're all in the same plane. So I want you guys to compare that to something like pseudostratified epithelium. And if you remember what pseudostratified means, it, it says it looks or appears stratified, but all those cells are in contact with the basement membrane. And so the key difference between this and, and simple uh, columnar is that the nuclei are all in one row, right? So if you look at that, uh, you look at simple columnar, all the nuclei in one row, you look at pseudostratified, you have what these call these basal cells, which are, are cells that kind of tuck under and then behind these other cells. So they're still all attached there. They're all attached to the basement membrane. It just appears that they're not. And so you have this really classic bivaried uh, nuclei level, all right, or nuclei rows. Again, you have these structures. You have those goblet cells, right? But here you have cilia. And cilia are related to microvilli in the sense that they are extensions off the cell, but they perform a very different function. And if we look at where these things are located, which is the respiratory passages, think about what cilia do, right? So cilia uh, are basically what it means is hairs. And the I am always imagine like kelp in moving in the ocean, right? So these things are actually coming in and trapping are trapping particles, dust particles, uh, whatever, in your respiratory packet, uh, passageways, and then helping to move them out. So if you ever cough up a big ball of phlegm, you have to thank your cilia at some level, right? Because they're trapping, with those goblet cells that are releasing, secreting mucus, you're trapping those particles and moving those foreign bar bodies out of the system, right? And so if you smoke, What's effectively happening is you're paralyzing the cilia, you're damaging the cilia, so they no longer can effectively move those the mucus bound with foreign particles and carcinogens out of your system. So it sits there and ends up draw, um, destroying or, or uh, mutilating the the cells there, and that eventually leads to cancer, right? And so. Think about the structures here. Okay, we have cilia here. Where do we want to be able to trap particles? We want to be able to do that in our respiratory passages. All right, here's another image. You can see that classic uh, bivariate uh, nuclei level and the cilia, which appears in this image to be much larger than the uh, microvilli. Okay, so we just covered all the simple epithelia. We're going to talk a little bit about stratified epithelia and where you find them. Again, they're defined by the apical layer. Uh, the deepest cells are going to sit on the basement membrane. The rest of the cells will attach to the cells below it. And then we get a couple variations, right? And we'll talk about this with stratified uh, squamous. So you get keratinized and non-keratinized. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we get there, which is right now. So Keratinized stratified squamous, we break that word down. Stratify means multiple layers. Squamous means the apical layer is going to be squished down. And we can see that, right? So if we go to where the, all the nuclei, nucle nuclei are and where that arrow is pointing, you can see that there is actually squished down, right? So if you go all the way to the right of your screen, right where the cells kind of transition, uh, and to the connective tissue, you can see that that's actually where the basement membrane is. And all that is stratified squamous. What makes it keratinized is that layer of dead squamous cells on top. And so that keratin is a protein that it toughens and hardens. And as the cells become waterproof and die, they get this property that offers a lot of protection. Where do you want a lot of protection? Your skin. Right? And so imagine if the blood went all the way to the surface of your skin. Every time you got a scratch, you'd just be gushing blood all over the place. What these dead squamous cells do is kind of a cushion to protect the actual living cells. And so you're constantly sloughing these things off, right? So, you know, dandruff, all these things are dead cells that are being uh, basically, uh, sh yeah, sloughed off. And 
uh, it takes probably uh, just a few weeks to kind of totally cycle through this process from the development all the way at the basement layer, the basal layer, to being uh, removed. I think it's about six weeks. Okay, and so here we have another slide image showing that. And the top layer is going to be the superficial part. And what the arrow is pointing at, okay, so what's in our skin that be, could be causing that kind of disruption in the view, right? So what's, what's looking at? When we look at that, what do we see? Right? What are we seeing? And the truth is, it could be a scar, it could be a pore, it could be a, the remnants of a hair follicle. Uh, these are all viable answers. What I want you guys to be thinking about is, okay, I'm looking at just a slide, but it's not just a slide of keratinized stratified squamous. There's a lot of other stuff going on in here. And you should always try to be thinking about, okay, what could this possibly be? Really trying to critically think and, and analyze and break apart what am I looking at. Don't just get honed in on one specific aspect. Look at the big picture as well. All right, so we're going to compare that to non-keratinized stratified squamous, which is exactly the same, except it doesn't have that thick layer of dead cells on top. And if you compare that, uh, an example would be your tongue, right? So if you touch your tongue and then you touch your arm or your, you know, your leg, it feels very different, right? And that's because your tongue did not have that keratinized layer. It's the exact same tissue with the exception of that keratinized layer. And so you're... It's really important to, for saliva, to everything, for your mouth to be moist so you can help digest food and, and taste and do all these other awesome things. But you still want some layer of protection. So the function of with the stratified squamous is you're still forming resistance against abrasion, but you're able to uh, have this moist or slippery layer there uh, as well. All right, so here's an example. You can see uh, non-keratinized, so you can see the nuclei going all the way up to the top, right? With the keratinized, you had that thick layer of dead cells, but here you can see that there's nuclei going all the way up to the superficial part or the apex of the stratified squamous. All right, so here's a little quiz. Uh, with the, uh, what you should be able to do here is break down what it is. So you should have an idea of what to look for. Right? Whenever you're looking for a slide, try to break down to these really simple components. How many layers does it have? Simple, stratified, pseudo-stratified. What's the shape? If you could do that, you're golden, right? And so the first one here is going to be simple squamous. Nope, just kidding. Simple columnar. The next one, which I don't have an image for, is going to be stratified cuboidal. The next one is simple squamous, and the last one is going to be stratified squamous, right? So you should be able to work your way through pretty readily and, and try to quiz yourself, try to bring in that DVD, use the internet, kind of use whatever resources you have to just get familiar with uh, identifying or naming the epithelium. Right, so again, we'll work our way through this. First one, those rings, classic simple cuboidal. The next one over on the top is a stratified squamous. And the one with the, the green one with the arrows is going to be simple squamous. Then to the right of that is simple columnar. And to the right of that is pseudo stratified columnar. Okay, and then the last one of the epithelial tissues we're going to talk about is transitional. And transitionals kind of doesn't fall into any categories because, I mean, it's multi-layered, but it's not really organized like the other stratified uh, epithelial. It's kind of globular, and that's what really dictates its function. It's really good at stretching. Right? So areas in your body that you want to be able to stretch make sense, right? Your kidney, your bladder, your urinary tract, right, in general is... These are areas that you want to be able to accommodate a large amount of liquid and not have it pass through immediately. You want to get whatever you, whatever nutrients you can out of it. And so here in this case, uh, the transitional epithelium is designed to be able to stretch. And you can kind of see 
it looks like a bunch of frog eggs in a way, but they are capable of stretching with tearing, without tearing. And if you look at those other ones, you look at simple squamous, if this were to stretch, it, since it's so t tightly packed in there, they wouldn't even be able to accommodate that. They just kind of rip apart. Okay, and the last tissue we're going to talk about in this chapter, uh, part one, is the nervous tissue. It's composed of neurons and glial cells. Right, those little blue dots that you see there are uh, the actual nuclei of the glial cells. And the function of the glial cells is, is really just to assist the neuron. The neuron's the big player in this situation. Right? And you see those uh, just as you expect in the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, the brain. And you're dealing with muscle control, uh, sensing stimuli, transmitting signals. Really, this is kind of the key wiring of our body. And so you can talk about a lot of the details of an axon, uh, of a neuron, where we can talk about axons and dendrites and things like that. I really wouldn't be too concerned with it, uh, mainly because you need to see the whole picture uh, to figure out which one's a dendrite and which one's an axon. All right, so the key again here is be able to identify the neuron itself and then the nuclei of glial cells. So the takeaway from part one start feeling comfortable with that relationship between structure, function, and location. Right? How do those things dictate each other? Right? How does something that's stratified offer more protection than something that's simple? Right? So think about how these things tie together and start building a big picture idea of what's going on. Right? You should also be able to feel pretty comfortable with identifying the functions and then the structures associated with the epithelial and nervous tissues and being able to generally describe how epithelial tissues are named.